Okay, so Book of Daniel, we're now into chapter 10. Um, we are right at the end, having spent a long time going through chapter 9, the 70 weeks of Daniel, a very, very important chapter of scripture, as we saw. We now come to essentially Daniel's last prophecy. It is, uh, in many senses, his, his most detailed prophecy. It begins in his own time and goes right the way through to the second coming and to the resurrection of the dead. In fact, as we come to the end of this prophecy, it does speak of the resurrection of the dead, which is one of the few places in the Old Testament that that is referenced and spoken of. Um, this chapter before us, chapter 10, is really the build-up to the beginning of the prophecy. The prophecy itself really runs from chapter 11, verse 2, right the way through that long, long chapter into chapter 12 and verse 4. So there's a lot of prophecy here and there's a lot to do. But this is the last one now of the book of Daniel. And the, it is more than any other part in the book of Daniel, this is the bit where the stuff that he prophesied, the beginning of that long span of prophecy that he does in chapter 11, the beginning of that section is dealing with stuff that was future for him, but is now past for us. From our perspective, it's history. From his perspective, it was future. But it is so accurate with regards to what he prophesied and how it came to be fulfilled that many liberal scholars would come along and say, oh, well, Daniel must have been written much, much later because he couldn't have possibly known that. And you're like, uh, duh, that's the whole point of prophecy, right? Um, and later archaeological discoveries have shown, have, have supported the earlier date for Daniel. And so we have an astonishing bit of prophecy to finish off this book that we've been going through now for so long. So this last three chapters is dealing with this last prophecy and this will be the ending of our time in Daniel. Um, so Daniel 10, let's have a look and see where we begin. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel who was named Belshazzar. Okay, so here's our beginning. We're given, again, as so often in Daniel, our historical um, timing, so we know exactly when this happened. This happened in 536 BC. We're actually going to go a little bit further on, and we're going to see the exact day of the exact month. So we're told exactly when this happened. Now, what is relevant for us is that this is now two years or so after the uh, time of the 70 weeks prophecy of chapter 9. That's important because Cyrus is the one who made the decree that started the clock of the 70 periods of seven years ticking away. And that was a future event in chapter 9. Now we're in the third year of Cyrus and he's given the decree already. The decree of Cyrus has been given. The Jews are now allowed to go and return to the land. Not only are they allowed, but the, the entire project, as it were, is going to be financed by the Medo-Persian Empire. God has moved on Cyrus's heart, given him a heart for the Jewish people, and they are now allowed to return from their captivity and return to their land and rebuild. And so this has now happened uh, possibly about two years previously. And we're now, as I said, in 536 BC. And Daniel is now 84 or perhaps 85 years old. Those of you who are older and those of us who are getting older, that's encouraging, isn't it? You think, you think how much of Daniel's life, and we, we, we started this journey in Daniel 1. And I can remember looking out at some of the younger ones here and saying, you know, Daniel was castrated. He was made a eunuch. That this, this guy was taken as, a, as probably somebody in his late teens, early 20s at the earliest, a young man in the prime of life, and he is made a eunuch. And he's taken away from his family and away from his home. And, and, and it's such an inspiring story in many ways that somebody who suffers so greatly at the prime of his life would, would be used so mightily by God and would remain faithful to God despite those difficulties. And yet so much of Daniel's prophecy comes in the final years of his life. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. It doesn't matter if we're you know, 10 or whether we're 110. 
if we have breath in our lungs physically, and if we have breath and life in us spiritually, i.e. we're believers indwelt by the Holy Spirit, then God has a purpose for our lives. And it doesn't matter if we've been castrated and taken to a foreign land. It doesn't matter if we've suffered turmoil and difficulty. It doesn't matter if we're sick or we're old or we're frail. But if we're breathing, then God has a purpose for our lives. That's such an encouragement. And Daniel continues on at 84, 85 years of age. And the word of God comes to him again. And here we have his name, but Daniel, and also the name that Nebuchadnezzar gave him way back in the beginning. It's about 70, maybe years, almost 70 years previously, the, the name Belshazzar. And the word was true, and it was a great conflict. And he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. So the word was true. I think that's, we, to understand that simply to mean that what was said will come to pass. This was a word of truth to understood, but I think it also, I mean, you'd think, well, that, duh, that's kind of stating the obvious there a little bit, and it is. So I think the fact that we're told that the word is true is in contrast to it saying that, the, that it was a great conflict. Now, the word here for conflict um, typically is used in the sense of warfare, but it can be used as a word that just speaks of difficulties in a general sense. And I, and I think the point here is that this is a word that is true and can be trusted, but it doesn't mean that it's fun to hear, and that it doesn't mean that it's easy, and it doesn't mean that it's nice. It's, it's a word, it's a prophecy that's going to speak of great conflicts, literally warfare, over the period of Jewish history. And it's also a word that, as we're going to see in a moment, gave Daniel great personal difficulty in the process of receiving it. You know, there is an expression that often comes up in the Bible where it speaks of the hand of God. The hand of God was upon someone. And you know, the more I read my Bible, the more I realize that that expression isn't always necessarily a good thing. Right? That the hand of God comes upon someone, and that's a tough thing, that's a harsh thing, that's a difficult thing. The, the, the Christian faith is a faith that on the one hand is the most glorious and blessed thing. You know, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, we say. And, and you know, Paul says to, in the letter uh, of Ephesians, he says that we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. He talks in Ephesians 1 about how the Father chose us, how the Son has saved us, and how the Spirit of God has made that, that redemption in Christ a reality for us personally. And he goes through all of these spiritual blessings, and, and our sins have been forgiven, we've been, we've been um, reconciled with God, we have peace with Him. I mean, the blessings of, in Christ are, are countless. But then to be a follower of Jesus means denying ourselves, taking up our cross and following him. Following Christ means not what the world would say in pursuing your own heart. There are some, some, there are many false teachers today that would say that we should pursue our hearts and we should do what we desire. I think it's Paula White, I read a quote from her recently that said something along the lines of, no Christ, if, if any, no, she said, if anyone tells you that you should deny yourself, they're from the devil. <laughs> That's the prosperity gospel in full flow. Well, that would be Jesus then, wouldn't it? If any man would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And Paul says to Timothy, as we know, that anyone who seeks to li live a godly life will be persecuted. So there is, this, there is this, this strange balance within the Christian faith where on the one hand it's this good and great and glorious and majestic and wonderful thing and it's not, it's not a, a but in the sense of, you know, but as well as that there's the negative. It, it, but in addition to that, there is a side of the Christian faith which is harsh and difficult. For us to walk as Christians means for us to daily say no to ourselves. In a, in a world that is designed and is telling you that you should say yes to yourself as often as you can. 
Do what gives you pleasure. Follow your heart. Pursue joy. Rid yourselves of prob problematic people. Ten steps to get rid of the toxic people in your life. And on all of this kind of stuff. And the entirety of the message of the world is that you are important and you are valuable. And therefore, you must give yourself everything that your heart desires and not let anybody else get in your way. But the message of, 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 uh, the, of the Bible is that you are precious in God's sight as Christians because he's chosen you. But because you're precious in his sight, you must constantly, daily, fight the battle against your sinful flesh. Deny yourself. Pursue him. And I think that that is well seen in this contrast before us of this prophecy. This prophecy is going to speak of God's glorious kingdom coming to pass. But the kingdom of light shines most brightly in the darkness it comes from. Our lives are this constant dichotomy of darkness and light where there's trials and there's sin and there's suffering and there's struggle and pain and anguish and death. And yet there is this constant light of God that shines in the midst of it. Is this prophecy a prophecy that is good and true and a prophecy that speaks of conflict and that was difficult for him to receive, is that not a picture of the Christian life? And so, he says he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. as a partial understanding, as will become clear in chapter 12, but nonetheless, he understood the bulk of what was being said. So much of this prophecy is expounding and adding to what we've already seen. Now in those days, that's the period of time leading up to the vision. I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, nor meat, uh, sorry, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. On the 24th day of the first, first month, I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, and lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man. Let's leave it there for now. Okay, so, let's have a look at what's going on here. First of all, Daniel is in a period of mourning. Daniel's in a period of mourning. Now, the huge question is, what was he mourning over? And it's not said, so that means only two possible things. Either we don't need to know, or we're supposed to know. Um, and my suggestion is to you, as I'll show in a moment, that he, we are supposed to know. And the reason that we're supposed to know is he specifically gives us dates and times. We know the year, we know the month, and we know the day. But with regards to his fasting, let's just consider this first of all. In many Christian circles, fasting, and I've mentioned this as he's dealt with fasting in Daniel before, but I'll do a little bit of repetition here. But with regards to fasting in Christian circles, fasting is perceived as a couple of things. Firstly, fasting is perceived as purely going without food and drinking water. That's the common definition of fasting. That's clearly not the case here. We're told that Daniel's fasting, and he is eating, but he's not eating delicacies. He's not eating meat. He's not drinking wine. Now, we know because he's part of the government officials. We know that because of his position in government there in Babylon, we know that he had access to the finest of food and what have you. And for this period, he is abstaining from the luxuries of life. Many of you would say, well, that's my life every day. And maybe that's the case. But what Daniel is doing is he's abstaining from luxury food items. And that ab abstination, is that a word? Abst abstaining, is... Um, is his fasting. So fasting is in a sense, while commonly just drinking water, can be a bunch of other things as well. The other thing that we, and we said this last time fasting came up in Daniel, but it's worth repeating, that fasting in Christian circles is, is grossly misunderstood as being a case of, well, I'll pray and I'll pray and I'll pray. Oh, nothing's happening. Well, I'll now pray and fast. It's like, you know, it's like, you know, you're, you're, you're playing some sort of racing car game and you're going to switch the nitro fuel on or something, you know, it's like you're going to give you that extra oomph, you know, there's prayer and then there's 
prayer and fasting, you know, new improved. It's like, it's like Duracell and Duracell Plus or something like that, you know. It's like that extra oomph, you know, let's, let's fast and really get things done. Guys, that is not biblical. It's very, very common understanding in Christian circles, but it is not biblical. The idea is not something you'll find in Scripture at all. Um, first of all, in the New Testament, there is no command to fast. Literally none. There was fasting in the Old Testament, but there isn't in the New Testament. We're not commanded to fast. The, much of the reasoning for that is because, as Jesus said, you know, John, he was told by the Pharisees, why did John the Baptist's disciples fast, but your disciples don't? And he made a reference to the bridegroom and the friends of the bridegroom, what have you. And the idea is, is that you, you have a period of mourning, but now, now the bridegroom's here. Jesus is here, right? So it's not a period of mourning. And, and fasting is, is universally in Scripture associated with mourning. So why is it that we have it in our heads that there is like prayer and then prayer and fasting? Because often our prayer is motivated by mourning. So that's why prayer and fasting sometimes go together. In other words, you know, that in, in, in many, many cultures, for, for huge periods of human history, if somebody died, you mourned. And part of that involved what you wore. You, you know, you've seen in the Bible, I, I imagine them several times, the idea of sackcloth and ashes. When, when Job's family dies and he's there mourning, we see him in sackcloth and ashes. He tears his clothes, these torn, dirty clothes. A man of great wealth as Job was now simply wears a sackcloth, torn. Why? Because he's mourning, it's clothes of mourning. We have a similar thing in our society, or we at least used to about a generation ago. It doesn't happen quite as much anymore. But when I was a kid growing up, if anybody older in the family passed away and died, then everybody wore black to the funeral. That was like, that was a standard wear that you would wear. And now in this era, we tend to be, well, let's celebrate their lives rather than mourn their deaths. And so not, it's not as universal to wear black. But in Bible times, it was sackcloth and ashes. And a similar thing was that when you were showing that you were mourning, that you would cease from eating. You would simply fast. That you were, you know, there are times maybe when you're so upset that, you know, you don't feel able to eat. And it sort of comes from that. I mean, you know, we're in a Baptist church here, so maybe we have the opposite problem. When we're, when we're sad, we eat more. And uh, when you go to a funeral, <laughs> this is a huge amount of food for you all to eat. I, I think sometimes funerals have more food than weddings, but that's another story. But this is the point of that culture there, and that's what's going on. So Daniel's fasting is associated with his mourning. He's mourning about something. We'll come to that in a moment. And that mourning is leading him into prayer. And it's going to become clear from what this, he is told later that he has been praying in the midst of this mourning. So what is he mourning over? Well, we know because the dates are given to us that this is now the third year of Cyrus's reign. We know that Cyrus has, um, has issued the decree for the Jews to return to the land. Okay, so here we are. 70 years the Jews have been in captivity. The captivity began 70 years previously with the first wave of captivity, Daniel and his friends and the key people being taken, and they begin the, the three-stage journey of the Jews into captivity. That happened 70 years previously. Now, after 70 years, the Jews are told, you can return to your land. And not only can you return, we're going to finance it for you. What do you think is going to happen? Celebrations, people rushing off. Well, according to the book of Ezra, chapter 2, verses 64 through 67, also the book of Nehemiah, chapter 7, less than 50,000 people went back. Less than 50,000. I know I don't need to tell you guys this, but might does not make right. Size does not determine faithfulness. These were the people returning as they were supposed to return, and the vast majority of Jews didn't return. Not only did very few return, but because very few of them returned, they were facing conflict in the land. Now, I, 
I'm tempted to turn there, but you know me. When I turn there, I get lost in the other passage I'm referencing. And I've got some more coming up later, and I don't want to keep you here forever. So you may want to make a note of Ezra chapter 4. But in Ezra chapter 4, um, there is talk um, of what was happening. And specifically, there were problems in the land. There was difficulties and discouragement. And the work that they were doing on rebuilding the temple was hindered. And it is almost certainly that that is the historical backdrop, and that is why Daniel is mourning. Can you imagine it from Daniel's perspective? He was the first wave going in. He has led the Jewish people while they've been in that foreign land, and he has been the person who's led the way. He repented on behalf of them, and he was the one who prayed that they would be able to turn from their sin and their idolatry and return to the land. And finally, the answer to that prayer has come and they can go and people are indifferent. Guys, it breaks my heart when the word of God is available to people more than ever before in this world and people are just indifferent to the word of God. Church after church is filled up with in places where the word of God isn't taught. People who wouldn't know their, their genesis from their revelation, TED Talks, Oprah Winfrey-esque, chicken soup for the soul, all blended with a few Jesuses thrown in. That's what draws the crowds. And then even when you have churches that teach verse by verse through the Bible, it seems that all there ever is is milk on the menu. And people are never given meat so that they can grow. And nobody wants to. Nobody wants to grow. We want to be spiritually lazy, spiritually unfit, spiritually fat, spiritually useless. Because we don't want to have to deny ourselves. We don't want to have to study the Bible. We don't want to have to endure sound teaching. We want to have our ears tickled and be told what we want to hear the way we want to hear it, and the church is suffering as a result. And where the church suffers, the nation around it suffers as well. And that's where we're at. And Daniel feels that mourning. And I feel that mourning, and I know many of you feel that mourning too. And so he mourns and he prays, and he doesn't anoint himself, does nothing to make himself look nicer. And he comes now to the 24th day of the first month, as we read. And that's significant. I'll tell you why it's significant. First month of the Jewish calendar was when they celebrated Passover. Passover was a time of feasting. A time of feasting. And Daniel chooses to mourn and to fast. He still ate. He had to eat. Why did he have to eat? Well, he had to do certain things because there were Passover celebrations. But I think at the same point, he had to eat because he's 84, 85 years old. Wouldn't have done him well to have eaten nothing for a few, few weeks. But he fasted in some way, even during a period of feasting. Such was the situation before him. And I imagine he's, he's a little confused. Because he was the one who sought... God over the return to the land. Now the return has been granted and so few have gone. And so he's sad, he's sorrowful, he's confused and he's been praying for three weeks. And there he is after his three weeks of praying and mourning and fasting. On the 24th day of the first month he stands on the bank of the great river and he lifts up his eyes and looks and behold a man. Now this is a magnificent this is utterly magnificent. He's there. I mean, what's he doing by the banks there? I haven't been able to come up with a clear answer for that, but he's out and about. I do most of my praying outside. I think some of you do as well. We get out and about into the wilderness and we pray. And uh, there he is out by the banks of the river and he looks up and there before him suddenly is a man. Not any man. Let's look at the description. Firstly, he's clothed in linen. That speaks of his purity. He is someone who uh, has a belt of fine gold from Euphaz. That will speak of his uh, priestly uh, or royalty. And then he is one who has a body like Beryl. Probably speaks to 
sort of perfect health, his face the appearance of lightning shining with glory, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. Some of you will say, that sounds mighty familiar. And that's because we have a very similar description in Revelation 1. I'm just going to turn there and read to you from Revelation. Then I turned, verse 12 of Revelation 1, to see the voice that was speaking to me. On a turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands was one like a son of man. That's a Daniel phrase, those of you who remember from chapter 7. Clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. Folks, that's not identical. But if two people saw the same thing, there are two descriptions of the same person. And Daniel has seen one like a son of man coming in the clouds, granted authority over every nation, every kingdom. And it is that one like a man who stands before him now in glory. It is that one, and I, and I have no doubt, I know some will debate this and we will talk about why, but I have no doubt because of the parallel in Revelation 1 that this is Jesus Christ. Absolutely no doubt. And... and, and for, for, I will, I'll be honest with you, last time I taught Daniel, I taught this wasn't Christ, and I'll tell you the reasons why later, but I just can't escape the intertextual connections with Revelation 1. Revelation 1 is clearly referencing Daniel 10. It's clearly the same thing being seen by John and by Daniel, and it is that same son of man. And... And uh, we'll talk a more a little bit about, uh, about that in a minute. But this is clearly Christ who appears. And so Dan, I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men who were with me did not see the vision. But a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. Now, this is fascinating. Okay, let's talk about this for a little bit. Only Daniel sees the man. But everybody else runs off and hides. So they don't see the man as Daniel sees the man, but they see something, right? Now, what does that remind you of? Well, that reminds me of Acts chapter 9 and Paul. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. This seems to be a reoccurring thing in Scripture, where Jesus appears to people, to his own, and others to whom the vision is not for, see something or hear something, but don't see him. Now, there's two and I don't want to get waylaid. I did think about like, making the entirety of the rest of the sermon on this point. But let me just very briefly make two major points from this. Okay? Point number one is this. We have seen a progression of visions of Christ through Scripture. It began, at least in the major sense, in Isaiah 6, where Isaiah sees a vision of the Lord high and lifted up upon his throne in the temple upon the earth. That's Isaiah 6. Then Ezekiel has the same vision and more detail is given in Ezekiel 1 and elsewhere in Ezekiel. Daniel sees that same figure. In, in Isaiah, it's just the Lord high and lifted up. 
In Ezekiel, we have our first reference to a man. In Daniel, we're told it's one like a son of man. And here in da that's Daniel 7, in Daniel 10, here he is as a man. And then when we come to Revelation, we see John seeing the same man. And, and the one that's often forgotten about in the middle of that is in Acts chapter 9, where the Apostle Paul sees Jesus Christ, who he'd read about in Isaiah, who he'd read about in Ezekiel, who he'd read about in Daniel, and he'd mistakenly persecuted the Christians, thinking that Jesus was some charlatan. And then Jesus shows up as the man of Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, and says, here I am, why are you persecuting me? It's just magnificent, isn't it? That he appeared to Paul like he appeared to, uh, to Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and then finally to John. And to those five, Jesus manifests himself. Did he manifest himself to others? Absolutely. Did he show up in pre-incarnate form to, to Abraham, to Joshua, and to others? Absolutely he did. But to these five, he appeared as one glorified. They got to see the glorified Christ taking his throne in his kingdom. How magnificent is that? And that is a privilege that Paul got to see uniquely. And that's what made him an apostle. Now, that's one main point, and we could talk about that for hours, but I have taught on a whole series on that, and you can go back on the church website and find those if you're interested. The second major point is this, is when Jesus shows up to reveal himself in his glory to his own, there is something perhaps seen and heard by others around, but they do not see him. It is not for them to see Christ, but they are aware that something has happened, something loud and scary that would make them flee and hide. But not nearly as scary as it is for those who actually get to see him, as we'll see with Daniel in a minute. One of the criticisms of a literal, sorry, I don't like the word literal, a plain interpretation of the Bible, taking the Bible at face value, is that Sometimes people have said, oh, this whole rapture thing, Christ coming back for the church, it's just this silly doctrine, secret rapture. You, you know, you get them, people saying things like, you know, there'll be this secret rapture, and suddenly one day, out of nowhere, all these people will disappear, and their clothes will be on the ground, and airplanes will fall from the sky. And, and it's often referred to, even by people who believe it, as the secret rapture. I just want to go on record. I, I, gen, I definitively believe in the rapture. I believe that Christ is returning for his church. I believe that the Bible teaches that. I do not believe that the rapture will be secret. This idea that suddenly people are going to just disappear, people go, oh, I went around to so-and-so's house and they weren't there. What on earth happened? Absolute nonsense. When Elijah was taken up into heaven, he was seen going into heaven. When Jesus went up into heaven, he was seen going up into heaven. And the disciples were told by an angel that he will return the same way he came. He will come, and we will see him come. But I don't think that those for whom he is not coming will see him as we see him. But they will see something. And they will hear something. And it will scare them witless. There will be nothing secret about it. Now, I, am, I, I do not want to ever engage in newspaper exegesis, but I do think that in our current era, if Jesus were to return in the sky as he left, and he were to be seen as a bright, glorious light, there would be a noise like many voices, and people are gathered up into the air. I know exactly what the world is going to say and think. And it will be blamed on aliens and that kind of stuff. Of course it will. And what has the last two generations of this world been, been talking about in fiction and even in places in non-fiction and preparing people's minds for for a very long time? I leave that with you. But suffice to say that when we see Jesus, when he comes to gather us 
whether we are living or dead, and we see him, there will be nothing secret about it. My conviction there for you. So, let us progress on to Daniel's response. I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, as we've seen the men who did not see it, but a great trembling fell upon them and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone, verse 8. And I saw this great vision and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed and I retained no strength. Well, he's an 84, 85 year old who's fasting and not anointing himself. So whatever radiance he had wouldn't have been huge, but that's gone as well. And he is in a place where he's obviously shaken. It reminds me of that vision of Isaiah. He sees the Lord high and lifted up. Woe is me, I am done, for I'm a man of unclean lips. This seems to be the response. I've got to be careful how much I say at this point, but there are those who claim to have seen visions in this day and age, and I really don't believe 99.9% .9 of them. And often it's this, oh yeah, Jesus spoke to me or an angel came to me and blah, blah, blah. Nonsense. Daniel was absolutely shaken by this. And we've seen this in previous visions and we see it for a time afterwards. That this was something that was traumatic for the man. It was not, a, 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 it was not just a kind of like, hey, I'm Jesus sort of thing. He saw him in his glory. There is a balance that we have to strike as Christians. Okay? On the one hand, we who were enemies of God because of our sin have been reconciled to him through the blood of Christ that we might approach the throne of grace. Amen? I mean, isn't that a great truth? That we as Christians can come before God and we can make our request known to him because he cares for us and we, can have, we should have no fear before him because the, the anger that he has for mankind, that the anger towards us has been removed because he placed that wrath upon his own son who died in our place for our sins. And so that blood, his death, has taken away God's wrath upon us. I mean, these are glorious truths at the heart of our faith. But do not ever think that as some of the more wacky, charismatic kind of end of the church often would say that Jesus is somehow your homeboy or some horrific expression like that. Yes, you can stand in the presence of God without being burnt up because of your sin, but you would tremble and you would shake and you would not be the same for weeks afterwards were you to see him in his glory. Never forget the glory and the majesty of God. Do not allow the glorious doctrine of reconciliation and redemption to allow us to take, to take our relationship with him in an almost blasé manner. And you know what's even more astonishing? Is that Christ in all his glory, through the person of the Holy Spirit, dwells in us. Do you understand that? That the majesty of Christ, that were we to see him before us, we'd fall on our faces in bewilderment and fear. All of a strength sucked out of us. No life in our faith. And yet, he's within us. That doesn't make him our buddy or our homeboy or anything like that. It is a somber and serious and glorious calling to walk a life of holiness, to pour out our lives as an offering before him, to live in fear and love no contradiction between those two. This is a, a sober re, re, reminder to us, is it not, of who we worship. 
I don't want us to go to either extreme. I don't want us as Christians to live in fear of God as if his wrath was still upon us. It's not. There's literally nothing you can do that would make God angry with you. Because Jesus died on the cross for all of your sins, past, present and future. So God can never be angry with you. And we're prone to walk in that direction sometimes, are we not? But then equally, we mustn't walk in the other direction and just say, oh, well, you know, sins are forgiven, Jesus is cool with me, we're all good. And forget the seriousness and the majesty and the glory and the holiness of this God in whose presence we would fall down. Which is a huge progress because for the unsaved in his presence, they'd be burnt up. And you know the greatest irony of all? is sometimes we go in both of those directions at the same time. And I don't understand it. It makes no logical sense. God forgive us and God protect us from such errors. So he's got no strength. In verse 9, I heard the sound of his words. As I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep with my face to the ground. <laughs> Sometimes you have to translate the Bible even after you've translated it into English. I think what's happened here is that Daniel has fainted. I mean, you could say that it was a supernatural fainting that God has put him into a, into a deep sleep. Or you could just read it like, you know, he was so overwhelmed and exhausted and drained by the whole experience that he just fainted. He saw God and he went, oh my goodness, drain face and boom, faint. But he's out. He's out. And then in verse 10, and behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. Now, I want to just tell you where I'm going with this in advance. As we proceed through this next section, now Daniel has woken up from his deep sleep. He's woken up by a hand. Now, I think it's, in, it's significant that he's woken up by a hand. He's not woken up by the hand. If it was saying it was his hand, i.e. the one he saw previously, then it would have a definite article. In fact, if it said the hand, then most English translations would translate it his hand. But it doesn't, it says a hand. Now, when we go a little bit further in this text, the one who now speaks to him says that he basically required assistance from the archangel Michael. We last week, at the end of chapter 9, saw the second coming of Jesus Christ. We referenced Isaiah 63, where Jesus specifically says... It is I who is mighty to save, and I came, and no one was able to help me, and I did it all by myself. So it doesn't seem very Jesus-like to need assistance from an archangel. In one sense, it's not a complete impossibility. We know that Jesus often uses other people. Me saying, I can't do this, would you assist me, is not the same as me saying, would you assist me? And I think that the text only does the latter. Sometimes God, well, throughout history, God does the things he does through his, his beings, his angels and his people as well, his church. So I don't think it's a complete impossibility, but I too am uncomfortable with the idea that this one now whose hand goes upon him is, is Christ because he would need assistance. Some people deal with this, and this is what I was referencing at the beginning of the sermon, by suggesting that, well, this person clearly can't be Christ because he needs assistance, so that this description of this person, though it's similar to Christ, is in fact simply an angelic being. Many people who I respect greatly hold that view, and I used to hold that view. But I think that the, probably the best way to understand the passage is here in verse 10 with the fact that we're told a hand touched him, that he sees the vision of Christ, he falls into a deep sleep, 
And having seen that vision, a hand wakes him up, and as had been previously in Daniel, he is now has communication with an angel who is going to explain to him and give him the word. But it began with a vision of Christ, and now there is an angel that is speaking to him. So I see from verse 10 onwards, once Daniel wakes up, that we're shifting from one person to another person, from Christ to an angel. And I think that that's probably the best way of understanding the text. The only other ways are you either make it all Jesus, in which case he needs assistance, or you make it all not Jesus, in which case the Revelation 1 parallels just make no sense. So I think that this is probably the best way of us understanding it. And it's clear from verse 10 and following that the one speaking to him now is an angel. A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. So he's being picked back up again, though he's not in a good condition still even now. And he said to me, O oh Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And again, that's the second point of reference. Now I've been sent to you. He saw Christ, but now I've been sent to you. And so there is a message that is said to him. It's not the first time Daniel has been called someone who is greatly loved, but it's quite an astonishing thing. There's more I want to say about that, which we'll do in a moment. And I when he'd spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. So he, he was knocked out on the floor. The hand touches him. He gets up on his knees, and now he's up standing before him to hear the message that has been given to him. And he said to me, fear not, Daniel, for the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. Guys, this is something that we need to grasp and understand. Now, I know that the bit many of you want to hear is coming up in the next verse. He was hindered by the prince of Persia. And then you got the prince of Greece coming. And we've got all this angelic stuff. I'm going to give you a heads up now. That's coming next week. Okay? So Prince of Persia, Prince of Greece, the angelic realms, and you know what that means and entails. There's too much to talk about in the time remaining. We're going to deal with that next time. So I want to end with this verse this week. So we can note moving ahead that this angel had sought to come to Daniel as soon as Daniel set his heart. But he was hindered. The Prince of Persia, verse 13, withstood me 21 days. In other words, there was a resistance, and I, I will tell you this much, the Prince of Persia is clearly an angelic being, and clearly not a good one. And the Prince of Persia had resisted this angel coming to Daniel, and Daniel has been fasting for three weeks. We can presume from what is said elsewhere that he was praying along with the fasting. And he's praying and fasting. And also in the text we see here that he has had set his heart to understand. In other words, why is it that you've allowed what we asked for, which is people to return, and no one's returning? And the few that have returned have such a hindrance. And I think that the answer here is very relevant to Daniel's situation, but it also has application to the situation for the Jews who've gone back to the land. So... The thing to note from the latter verses for now is that the second he started praying, from the beginning of his prayers, his prayers were making a difference in the angelic realm. Now we'll talk about that all next time. But what it means is that Daniel's prayers were heard. Daniel's prayers were heard. Daniel was taken at a young age and he was whisked off. He had Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego with him. And they proved to be faithful as well. But we're not told that any other Jews who went into the land were faithful. We should probably presume that they were amalgamated into the world of Babylon, which was the intention all along. Three years of training in the school of Babylon. They were, as uh, you Star Trek fans will know with regards to the Borg, they were assimilated. They became part of the collective of Babylon. All these various nations around were brought in together into one big melting pot to be taught to think the same way, act the same way, behave the same way. I will ref 
refrain from any reference to the World Economic Forum and, the, and WHO at this point, but um, yes, gathering everybody together into one big melting pot has always been the way of the enemy. And that's what happened in Babylon, and they all came in, and they all became like that, but Daniel stuck out, uh, stood out, and for, for so much of his life, from a, from a teenager through to his 80s, in a position of power in Babylon, in some way, shape, or form, for most of that period of time, he was standing alone. When he was thrown into the lion's den, he was standing alone. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were went in the fiery furnace, they were standing alone. So much of this was a lonely furrow. It was, it was so hard and so lonely. We're in an era, as I've referenced already, where the largest church in America last I heard, it may have changed, but it's certainly in the top two or three, is, is Joel Osteen down in Houston. And every time the church goes on, it's like a rock concert. And the Bible isn't preached, and the word isn't taught, and the gospel is a false gospel, and I don't believe he's saved, and nor are most of the people who go there. There is a prosperity gospel that tells you to have your best life now. When Jesus says, come after me and deny yourself, and take up your cross. That there are two competing gospels. And, and, then, and, and then there are the churches where you know they have a true gospel, but it's kind of like it's worldly Christianity. It's like, well, be a Christian, but don't adjust your life too much. Let's not say anything that's going to cause controversy. We don't want the world hating us now, do we? There's churches that we that is the church up on sick that we drive past as we come in. It's got its LGBT, LBTQ and transgender banner outside. I mean, forget Romans 1, let's just make sure the world loves us. And we're in that era where we can see so clearly the truth of what Jesus said about the gate and the way being narrow. What is our job in the midst of that? Hear me well, friends. To be faithful. That's it. To be faithful. Daniel's life is a life of faithfulness. That's it. It's a life where from beginning to end he was faithful. It is not like Samson where he was continuously disobedient but God used him anyway. He's not like Abraham who lived a life of partial obedience that gradually got sorted out over decades. This is a guy who from the beginning was found to be faithful. And he was greatly loved. Friends, you have to decide now. Are you going to be someone who seeks to be popular? Even in the, amongst Christians in a church. Are you going to make your life a good one? Are you going to make yourself happy? Are you going to do what suits you? Are you going to look after yourself? Are you looking forward to, to great glory in this life? You, is this world your home? You have to decide. Or are you going to pour your life out as a drink offering? Does the desire for God to speak of you as greatly loved faithful servant, does this desire overpower all others? Does it overpower the desire for comfort? Does it overpower the desire for prosperity, for well-being, for health? Daniel prayed and fasted. He stood alone, and what he did made a difference in the heavenly realms. What you do as an individual, and what we do as a church, puts more fear into the heart of Satan than what a thousand Joel Osteen type churches would do with the tens of thousands gathered together. God seeks faithful servants. The enemy fears God's 
faithful servant. And he sends his demonic realm to war to hinder the fruit of those faithful servants. So what does faithfulness look like? We devote ourselves to Christ. We place his word in our hearts and in our lives. We bow before him in trust and in prayer. And we gather together as a church, worshipping him as one, being equipped through the teaching of the word of God, milk and meat. And having been equipped, we are equipped to do the work of ministry, which is as varied for us as we are varied as people, but is the same ministry in the sense that it is the ministry empowered by the Holy Spirit, that we might serve not ourselves but one another, and that as we minister to one another, we grow in maturity and Christ-likeness as one. Ephesians 4. That's what faithful Christianity looks like. And it's not easy, and it's not fun, and it requires sacrifice, and it hurts, and it will bring tears. And I feel a bit Winston Churchill here, promising you blood, sweat, and tears, and that's it. And especially in a church like ours, that right now, after all the COVID departures, feels like a church plant. We're starting afresh. We've got a lovely building, fantastic resources, and we begin afresh. And church plants are hard work. Lots of work to be done, lots of things to do, and all the blessings that people tend to want from churches for themselves, many of them aren't here. But I'm greatly encouraged by Daniel, and I hope you are too. And where does it all begin? It begins with a heart that grieves for the things that grieve the heart of God. It began with Daniel mourning. There is nothing that will hinder our work more than satisfaction. And then again, as we've said several times this morning, there's that balance, isn't there? On the one hand, we don't want to be grumbling. On the other hand, we don't want to be satisfied. We need to mourn over the state of our hearts and our sin. We need to mourn that the people of Burbank live in their sin, hate God, and stand under his judgment. We need to mourn that the Christians of Burbank seem to want comfort more than they want to make a difference. Let us be grieved over these things. Let us bow before God who can answer these prayers and let us cry out to him, not for one day and not for 21 days, but just until God shows up. Being confident in this, that in the time that we wait and as we pray, God hears, God works, and we're being found to be faithful. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your greatness. May the truths of this passage resonate within us and may our lives be changed by it. Equip your saints this day for the work of ministry that you might be glorified as we are changed, as we minister one to another. Amen.